So welcome in our beautiful picture house to hear the second plenary talk. And I was appointed a person who is going to introduce the invited speaker. So regarding his education, Professor Edger is a pure product of the Linguistic School and Center for Cognitive Science in University of Edinburgh in Scotland. In Edinburgh, he received his MA in Linguistics and Artificial Intelligence in 1989 then Master of Science in Cognitive Science and Natural Language Processing in 1990. And finally, in Edinburgh, he also defended his PhD thesis on functional heads and interpretation in 1994. Soon after, however, he started to move southward and became a lecturer and later an assistant professor in the University of York. In the 21st century, he went further to the south and arrived at London. Since 2002, he has been affiliated with Queen Mary College, University of London. Here he also became Professor of Linguistics in 2006, and now he is the Head of School of Languages, Linguistics and Film. <laughs> yeah. David Edger is widely known not only to his linguistic colleagues, but virtually to every student of generative grammar in Europe thanks to his introductory textbook, Core Syntax, published in 2003, together with some related electronic teaching materials. More senior students learn soon that Edger has also undertaken serious research work on Gaelic, especially Irish. The audience in this room knows that his papers are many, and they deal with syntax, syntactic features, structure building, categorial labeling, and also semantics. And lately, he is studying topics in parametrization, language varieties, and evolution. Edge's last monograph, published in 2013 by MIT Press, is a syntax of substance. Apart from his own research, David Edger is an editor of the Willie Blackwell Syntax Series, co-editor of Oxford Studies in Linguistic Theory, and a member of the editorial board of several other journals. He does reviews for linguistic papers and works as a PhD supervisor and external PhD examiner. Some of his students, supervisees in examinees are right in this room, and they can give us their opinion about whether David deserves the Draper's Prize for Excellence in Teaching, <laughs> which he was awarded in 2006. I am mentioning his pedagogic activities in such detail because this is how I first met him. Far down on his long CV, there is the following entry, International Summer School in Linguistic, all meets the Czech Republic. As you can see behind me, <laughs> no. David Edger enjoyed his stay in Olmutz. He was very good. And we enjoy his presence in one of the early years of the so-called Egg Summer School. So now he is back, and instead of the Semantics of Functional Categories, which was the name of his course in 1996, he chose to tell us everything about the constraints on phrase structure. Thank you very much, Lida. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lida, and thank you for organizing, along with all, all of your helpers, this amazing conference. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yes. So it's interesting to... Um, is, is, this is working okay? Yeah. It's interesting to hear, actually, what I did <laughs> way back when, because I suddenly realized that quite a bit of what I'm going to talk about today, also the, um, also the talk is called Constraints and Phrase Structure, actually is connected to my thesis and to that Olamut's course on the semantics of functional categories, which has been something that's been a bit of an obsession of mine over the years. Um, so what I'm going to do today, though, is I'm going to talk about kinds of movement and how those kinds of movement relate to interpretation at the PF branch of the grammar and at the LF branch of the grammar. I'm going to make an argument that some types of movement, and this is, I think, a fairly well-known argument, but I'll just rehearse it here, that have been proposed to handle linear order effects simply don't have any semantic effects, and 
I, I'm going to highlight that that's kind of problematic. And the two kinds of movement, I think, that are like this are head movement, on the one hand, and roll-up movement, on the other hand. Okay? So I'm going to uh, show that these two kinds of movement are problematic, and I'm going to argue for a system of phrase structural representation that actually doesn't have any capacity to do head movement, so there is no head movement, or roll-up movement, so there is no roll-up movement, and that means that the system of, uh, rep of phrase structural representation that I'll propose just doesn't have it in it, the wherewithal, to do those things that I'm going to argue independently you don't want to do. Okay, so that's the basic structure of what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to argue that basically uh, the, the reason we don't have head movement is because really there aren't any heads. <laughs> And the reason that we don't have roll-up movement is because extended projections are kind of unitary type of elements, and they just can't be broken up. So that's going to be the core take-home message, is that there are no functional heads, and moreover, extended projections might be going, extended projections aren't the projections of functional heads, but no. So extended projections are, are unitary elements that can't be broken up. Okay, so... Um, Empirically, I'm going to argue that there are some nice consequences for this, and uh, one of the consequences is going to be that it allows us to revisit what we used to do when I was a student as head government effects on movement. So we're going to go back and have a look at some cases of these, especially with VP topicalization. All right, so that's where uh, I'm going to go. Let's have a look if this works. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to start with just a couple of kinds of movement that do have semantic effects. So if we look at a bar movements, something like, who did Anson say that Lily scratched? Lily's my cat. Okay. Um, the, uh, everyone knows that this has strong interpretive effects. Okay. We can see, uh, we can understand the two parts of the two occurrences of the moved element who in semantically distinct ways. So who at the start of that sentence there is understood as some kind of a binder, and who in its base position is understood as some kind of a bindy, something that's bound, like a variable. Okay? So, we, so WH movement is one of these movements that's extremely well behaved, really, from the perspective of the relationship between syntax and semantics, because it's sort of transparent in how the output of WH movement connects with the semantic interpretation. And we understand fairly well also the kinds of features that drive this kind of movement. I mean, there are lots of open questions, of course, but we understand that it's got things to do with question formation, focalization, topicalization, and so on. So a bar movement's really quite well understood, although, as I said, there's a lot of work still to be done in, in figuring out you know, further properties of it across languages. All right, so a bar movement is, I think, the easiest one. Okay? Um, a movement, I actually think A movement is weird, <laughs> um, because A movement uh, interrelates with the semantics. It certainly interrelates with semantics, that's why it's movement, but it interrelates in a very strange way. It's not as simple as A movement, uh, sorry, A bar movement. So if you have a look at example two there, every cat seems to its owner to be worthy of the prize, okay? You can see that um, every cat there, under the standard analysis, has raised from the lower clause into the higher subject position, okay? And from that higher subject position, it's able to bind the pronoun it's there. So what that shows you is the A movement feeds certain aspects of semantic interpretation, okay? Now, there are, so we can see the A movement you know, exists as a linear thing, so you, you, you change the linear order of the structure, and uh, it also has these interpretive effects. They're kind of reasonably well descriptively understood, but not totally. So there are complex questions to do with the kinds of relationship that A movement has to semantics. For example, scope reconstruction and binding reconstruction behave slightly differently with A movement than you might expect, and, and differently from uh, A bar movement. So we kind of understand it, but I think there's a lot of work still to be done there. Um, and the features driving it, well, we don't really know what's going on there, right? So EPP features, that's really just the name for a problem. Uh, phi agreement, case, maybe as Chomsky said yesterday, it's something to do with labeling. We don't really know, right? I mean, so there's a mystery there. So A, so a bar movement, pretty good. We kind of understand that. A movement, we know it has some semantic effect. We know there's a relationship to the kind of LF that it builds, but there are still open problems, okay? Head movement is distinct again. So head movement, again, we know that it creates new linear orderings, 
All right? So here's an example from Scottish Gaelic. So, scrop and cacht Ian, right? The cat scratched Ian. And uh, there's masses of good evidence in the Celtic languages that really there's a VP, that that verb scrop is in constituency with the object, and it's been head moved. It's been moved. Somehow the linear order of that has been disrupted by some kind of process, putting the, ver the finite verb initially. Okay, so that's head movement. What about if we ask what kind of interpretive effects there are for head movement? Well, I'll, I'll come and talk about those in a little bit more detail later, but they're not really descriptively understood at all. Right? We don't really know what the, what the interpretive effects of head movement really are. And there's no obvious logical interpretation. So, you know, with A-bar movement, there's a kind of obvious binder, bindy logical interpretation. With A movement, it's not quite so clear, but you can sort of see that it, ha it feeds scope in some kind of fashion. Right? So that you saw that that higher raised subject had a kind of scopal effect. Um, but what, what's head movement doing? It doesn't seem to have any, anything it feeds in the semantics. Okay? And what about what are the features that drive it? Again, I mean, if A movement was a mystery, then head movement's even more of a mystery. Right? So, you know, is it just some random EPP thing? Does it have to do with the construction of morphological uh, structures, like people have said before. N none of this really seems to have, I mean, none of it's remotely well established. So we, we, it's kind of a mystery again. It's quite a lot we don't know, actually, right? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that's head movement for us. Um, within head movement, I think there are a couple of issues that we need to keep separate, and this will be just helpful to keep in your mind when I go on and look at the remainder of the talk. So two issues that need to be kept separate in head movement are, on the one hand, the position of the head, the linear position of the head in the structure. How high is it? So Joe Emmons, in his early work on uh, the differences between French and English, for example, proposed to deal with this by a movement operation that changes the position of the verb, right, in a way that's not connected with the inflection of the verb. It's just a question of how high the verb is, okay? Later on, people began to say, well, you know, head movement could maybe also be considered to be something you could use to build morphological structures. Right? So, but those are two logically separate kinds of things. Right? All right. <coughs> um, so I'll go back now to the question of whether there are any interpretive effects of head movement. There really are very, very few. Okay? The, the, the most compelling one I know of was noticed by uh, Jim McCloskey back in the mid-90s, and has been recently resurrected by Ian Roberts in his head movement book a couple of years back. Um, and it's got to do with the licensing of NPIs under the scope of moved negation. So if you have a look at four, which one of them does anybody like? That's bad, because the NPI anybody doesn't have any negation nearby to license it. Okay? If you say which one of them doesn't anybody like, that's good, right? And it's good because nt seems to be in an appropriate position to license the C command or whatever the appropriate relationship is, anybody. And if you say which one of them does anybody not like, again, that's bad. And that's because the negation is not in the relevant position to license anybody. So you might say that actually what's going on in five is that the basic position of negation is low down next to tense, and it's been pied piped by head movement up into a C position, and therefore that head movement feeds an aspect of interpretation, scopal aspect of interpretation to do with negation and uh, NPIs. So that's, I think, the most compelling argument that head movement really does have some semantic effect. There are various other kinds of arguments in the literature, but I don't think that they're compelling. So uh, Benedicto has some discussion of existential readings in Romance languages, and Vinnie Lechner has a paper on split scope constructions in German. But both of these arguments, I won't rehearse them here, but both of these arguments really require a bunch of extra stipulations in order to reach the conclusion that head movement's having an interpretive effect. Right? So I think these are not straightforward arguments. They're really quite intricate, and I don't find them particularly compelling. All right, so um, just back to the, this distinction we talked about between height and uh, morphological um, structure, okay? So um, I think that we have to say there's a dissociation between these two things. Um, so for example, have a look, at, uh, skip seven just now, and have a look at eight. So eight, if, if Daniel Harbour was here, he'd pronounce this for me, but something like, Hayato hon de hei mot o. Does that sound good in this? 
Uh, and Daniel's probably cringing somewhere. Um, so uh, what we argued in our 2009 monograph on Kiowa, this is from Kiowa, uh, Kiowa it's known language spoken in Oklahoma, very endangered language actually. What we argued there is that the only real analysis you can give of this is that Kiowa verbs are very, very low in the structure. They never raise high, okay? And yet they have incredibly rich suffixal uh, inflection to them. So as you can see there, hey, mot, oh, right? Die, negation, modality, okay? And we showed that that's a single word, okay? Rather than three separate units. Uh, and we showed that the whole thing was extremely low. So that tells you that, um, you know, if you want to say that head movement is one way of building up structures, building up word structures, it can't be the only way, because since this verb is low, it's not raised, and yet it's richly inflected, okay? So, if he, I mean, if you said, I mean, you might say, oh, head movement is the way you build up morphological structure, but you'd need at least one other way of building up morphological structure in order to deal with these Kiowa things. And in fact, that's a, that's a sort of bifurcation of analysis that's been around forever. You can say the same about English inflection, which is the example in seven, a much less, you know, punchy example. But basically, current theory more or less says, or current kind of standard theory, more or less says that inflection lowers in English, but the verb raises in French. So word formation is done in distinct ways in both of these things. In one case, it's done essentially the syntax feeds it, and the other way it's done in the morphology. And that's the kind of standard picture, and it's not a very pleasant picture, really, if you think about it. Okay, so um, as well as, uh, so, you know, head movement may be the thing that puts verbs in kinds of positions, right? But it's probably not the thing that builds word structure, or not the only thing at least. Um, and then there are a bunch of well-known theoretical problems uh, that have been around for a long, long time with respect to head movement. So the extension condition, there's kind of cyclicity, you can't excorporate, you know, the, all these kinds of extra stipulations need to be added in to head movement, or exceptions need to be made for head movement, given current theoretical uh, um, assumptions. So, you know, head movement, as we all know, is pretty problematic. Okay? So it doesn't feed interpretation apart from this one example that I gave you, and it looks problematic from a theoretical perspective as well, and it's not the only way that we, need, that we have to build words. So it's, you know, it's not good. It's just not good. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I, I really think that what we use uh, head movement for is, is really what Joe said initially, right? We use it to place things in linear order with respect to the rest of the structure. That's fundamentally what we use it for. So it's a, you might call it a word order movement, okay? There's another kind of word order movement that has become extremely um, prominent in, in the last uh, decade or two. Um, so, uh, and that's roll-up movement, right? And I'm going to distinguish between two kinds of roll-up movement. One is roll-up movement, which essentially just reverses the scopal order, okay? And the other one is roll-up movement, which, uh, which is a bit more extended than that. I'll come back to that in a second. So, for example, um, uh, you know, there are many analyses around today of cases like, say, something like nine, which is Thai, right, where you have police classifier that, right, which is the reverse of, the, uh, of what you might see in Chinese, where you have that classifier police, Okay? And the idea would be that basically both of these languages are the same in terms of their, the scopal hierarchy. And the way that you get Thai out is you first of all generate, well, you know, first of all generate, um, um, uh, but you basically start off by, by taking police, merging classifier with that, moving police over the classifier, merging the demonstrative with that, and then moving that whole thing over the demonstrative. Okay, it's a slight dodginess with uh, that very first 10A, that that shouldn't be there. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. So that's roll-up movement. What's it doing? Well, what it's, what it's fundamentally doing is getting the order right, right? Saying, here's the scope. Here's one way of getting that scope out. It's just to say those classifier please, that's Chinese. And here's another way we roll things around and then we get please classifier those. Okay, so it's a way of getting the word order to work. Now, interpretive effects of roll-up movement, apparently none. I mean, I have not been able to find any interpretive effects, and there's a large chunk of that book that uh, Lita mentioned, the last few chapters of that book, trying to show that when you do roll-up movement, what you really need to do is you need to delete all the traces. 
and even then it doesn't work actually. But uh, you know, if you were, uh, I mean, that that you know, in general with roll-up movement, we just assume that you delete all of the traces from interpretation. Nothing's interpreted. So basically, there's there's no tail position of the movement chain in the structure. Okay. So roll-up movement doesn't have any interpretive effects. Uh, what drives roll-up movement? Again, somewhat of a mystery. So uh, Anders Holmberg and late, after that Marit Julian had a suggestion that it was to do with this, the parameterization of how C selection works. It works essentially via, you know, for some languages it works via basically, you know, sisterhood, complementation. For other languages, you kind of move the thing around. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Kane is more... Uh, you know, straightforward and says, oh, there's these features, we'll call them W for word order, and then those are the things that drive the movement, right? So it's, it's kind of well known that what roll-up is, it's just a way of getting the word order, it doesn't have any interpretive effects. Um, all of the arguments that are, are around for roll-up movement are fundamentally theory internal, I think. Um, and you can do roll-up movement, I mean, sorry, you can do the kind of structures that you would get from roll-up movement by just not doing roll-up movement <laughs> and by either just adjoining things on the other side or I mean, there are lots of technical ways you can do it with no movement and we'll maybe talk about one of them later on. So, you know, I mean, there are other ways of doing this that don't involve movement. It's a movement that doesn't have any impact upon interpretation and it's really just a pure word order movement. Okay, so that's head movement and... Uh, roll-up movement of, of that sort, um, there's also a kind of roll-up movement that, that looks more real, that looks like it's not just theory internal, okay? And, those are, and what I mean by roll-up movement in this case is when we take one chunk of, uh, of a projection of, say, a verb, and we, and we take that away from the rest of the projection of the verb and move it higher, okay? So it's a little bit like roll-up movement, but longer than the reversal roll-up movement I just showed you. So uh, a classic example of this would be something uh, like uh, VP topicalization in English. So, for example, you get something like, and scratch, and, you know, uh, Lily's likely to scratch Anson, and scratch Anson, Lily will. Okay, so where you take the VP there, and we move it into some higher position. What's happening there is we've taken, you know, a piece of the head complement, head complement functional structure and moved it away into a higher specifier. Right, that's the standard analysis of it. So that looks like the same kind of thing that we saw in these roll-up derivations in as much as we take a head complement, we take the complement and we move it into some, higher, in, in some position higher up than the head. It's the same kind of thing happening for uh, VP uh, movement here, but here we, we probably do have some good evidence that really there is movement in this case. Right? And we'll come back to that. In fact, there's good evidence you can see. You, for these cases, uh, you can actually see reconstruction effects of the VP. So it really looks like you have evidence for the position of the trace. All right. Um, what am I going to say here? Okay, so uh, there's another thing that, um, that follows. Uh, no, it's not another thing that follows. There's another thing I want to notice about this kind of roll-up movement, right, the not-reversal kind, which is that it seems to be subject to a condition, as far as I know, huh, well, apparently apart from Polish, <laughs> grr, apparently apart from Polish, uh, and virtually every language I can, uh, I've found requires some kind of element, some kind of head-like element left over to license the trace of the moved VP. Okay, um, so you see this in English. You can, you can't say and scratch Anson Lily, right? You have to say and scratch Anson Lily did. Okay, uh, and here's an example of Hebrew. So you can't say liknot et haprachim he, right? So bought the flowers she. You can't say you have to have some. You have a copy of the verb in this case. You have, you have the, this kanta. Is, oh, sorry, kanta there is a copy of. Uh, work. Can you see that? Yeah. So kanta there is a copy of that liknot verb. You can see kitnet. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so languages in general, when they do this VP movement, seem to have some kind of what looks like an old-style head government requirement on the trace, right? The trace needs to have some head ne next to it, right? and that seems to be true across at least many languages. And that doesn't follow from, you know, as, as we'll see, it doesn't follow from a simple movement account. You have to add that to a simple movement account, right? So a single movement account, you could just say, well, we take the trace, and we'll, oops, sorry, we take the VP, and we'll move it. We have to say, and on top of that, the trace needs to be head governed. Right? It's an extra thing we need to add. So I'm going to try and build a system where we, that extra thing just comes for free. 
Okay, so let's recap on this then. So um, we've seen two kinds of movement that, ha that feed semantics quite clearly. Uh, and we've seen two kinds of movement that don't, or at least don't so obviously. So head movement and roll-up movement in general, I think, are effectively techniques we have to get things in the linear order we want, given what we know about the underlying structure. Okay? Um, and they don't seem to have semantic effects. All right? so, so that's, I think, like, I mean, really, ideally, we want to not have them. Right? We ideally want a system which says, each syntactic operation ha correlates with a semantic operation, or at least a semantic, semantically contentful representation. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that of the, the roll-up movement where we did VP topicalization seems to come along with this head government effect, and that doesn't follow from just moving the VP, right? That would have to be something that's stipulated extra. And so those two things I'm going to take as general desiderata. And I'm going to, what I'm going to say is that, well, what I'm going to do is construct a theory of phrase structure representation, which is constrained in such a way it has the following things as consequences. There are no word order movements. All movements feed semantics. Right? There are no word order movements. Um, and I'll show you as a side effect of this particular approach, we derive the head government requirement on VP shift. Okay, so that's where we're going. Now we get... That, that was sort of non-technical, here's the intuition where we're getting at type stuff. So now I'm going to do some funny brackets and weird symbols and stuff. Um, and I'll try and begin to build up a system which has these things as consequences. So let's start where all good minimalists start with merge. Which as uh, Chomsky said yesterday, is the fundamental operation for any computational system. Okay, so um, I've given you there a definition of merge which comes from Collins and Stabler's forthcoming paper on the formalization of minimalism. Okay? And they basically say, okay, they're a little bit more uh, detailed than Chomsky is about this, and they basically say, okay, let's, let's imagine we're building some structure. We put some things in our workspace to begin to build this. And then uh, what we do is we form sets out this. Now, their definition includes this little uh, sub-clause, or coordinate clause here, and X and Y are distinct. So basically they say, let W be a workspace, let X and Y be syntactic objects where X and Y are in W, right? And X and Y are distinct, okay? Then the external merge in that workspace of X and Y is the set XY. It's a little bit more than uh, what Chomsky said yesterday. But the reason they say an X and Y are distinct is because, uh, well, in general, if they weren't distinct, you would end up with structures which were not binary branching, right? Uh, now, why would that be? Well, if you take x and you take y non-distinct from x, that is x again, right, and you form a set out of that, right, then what you get is a set with cardinality 1. You're taking two things, but they're the same thing, so the cardinality of the resulting set is 1. There's only one thing in it, okay? So that's not a binary representation that you've finally got out of there, right? So it's a unary representation. Now, this idea uh, that actually... so so. What I'm going to suggest then is a very minimalist move, which is let's remove this extra stipulation from the definition of merge. Let's remove this distinctness condition from our definition of merge, and let's allow X and Y to be the same thing. I'm not the first person to say this, so um, Guimarães uh, had a paper way, way back which, where he attempted to solve some problems with the LCA through this, this theoretical move. And Kane, in his Antisymmetry in the Lexicon paper, uses it as well. But they are very restricted in how they use it. So they say, we'll, we'll allow self-merge just at the very root of the tree, and that will solve some problems that the LCA has in that the root of the tree is too symmetrical. Okay? So um, I'm going to just say, no, we, if we remove it, we remove it. Right? And therefore, there is no distinctness condition. And therefore, these unary branching structures are fine. They're absolutely top-notch. Okay? So um, let's take, for example, a very simple derivation like the one you see in 16 there. So we've got, let's take x and y, where y is non-distinct from x. So, y, so, right? so we, it's basically, we've got x and we've got x again. We form a set out of that. And that's equivalent to just the set containing x. Right? Now we can take that as our input and do just exactly the same thing, and that's equivalent to the set containing the set containing x. 
And we, right? So now we've got this kind of structure, which is, in a sense, not got any bifurcation inside it, right? It's just a single unit. Um, we could take y, merge that with y, do the same kind of thing there. And then we could take that x thing there and merge it with y, and we get a, a normal binary merge kind of structure there. Okay? So the, the idea here then is to remove the distinctness condition, thereby simplifying the definition of merge, which lets in all these structures. So you, you're like, but David, you've now got a whole pile of you know, more complex structures, or you've got more sets of structures, and that's absolutely true. So what this, uh, what this allows us to do is to create structures that look like this, right? So I, I'm assuming that x and y here are just roots, whatever they are. They're just basic bits of, uh, of vocabulary. And then here is x, which has been self-merged. So you get a structure containing x. I've just labeled it with a black dot. Then we self-merge that. We get a structure containing that. Then we binary merge these two things, giving a structure here. Right? So, so what we've got then is just structure. It's built up. You can see that we've got here a uh, structure built up with no merge of an extra head. Right? You just build it up from self-merge. OK. So um, what does that do for us then? Well, I think what it does for us is it allows us, let's go back here, it, it gives us a structure without the merge of a head. Now, you may say to yourself, well, maybe that's why you can't, maybe you can get rid of the distinctness condition for merge, okay? But then you can say, well, if you ever did, if you ever used this kind of merge, the self-merge business, what you'd end up with is an unlabelable structure because you can only get labels when you merge in a head, okay? So you might say that's the way to, to go in terms of like ruling out these kinds of structures. But I'm going to go in an entirely different way, and I'm going to say actually what we're going to do instead is just get rid of heads, okay? And we'll label these structures independently of the existence of heads. Now what licenses me to do that is, is an observation that sort of emerged in the early 2000s, um, I think Michael Starke was the first one to, to say it um, clearly, but you see it all in my textbook, and you see it also in Edwin Williams' representation theory book. And it's the idea that complementation between functional categories and their complements is somehow special. It's not the same as C selection or S selection. It's something extra, it's something that simply needs to be stated independently of any other kinds of facts. So the way that uh, Starke um, implements it is he says, there exists an F sec, which is a sequence of functional projections such that the output of syntactic operations must respect FSEC. So he's saying, you know, you've got this FSEC and it sort of says above V there's little V and above little V there's T. And, well, he ha obviously has 350 of these, right? But, um, but, but what you do is you say, okay, well, when I merge in little V, I've got to respect the FSEC that's there. When I merge in T, I've got to respect the FSEC that's there, okay? Which says that T is going to be above little V, okay? So, um... Oops, sorry. So that's what Starke says. And, I'm, I'm, and you know, I say something similar in my textbook. I have this hierarchy of projections. And I say, each time you do a merge, you better respect that hierarchy of projections. And that's a distinct kind of thing from a C selection and S selection. I think there's very good arguments for that. Um, so the proposal then is, let's just take that as true. Right? If that's true, then actually, we don't need heads to do the labeling here. What we can do is we can take x. We self-merge it, build a piece of structure, and we say to ourselves, okay, well, let me go and look at, you know, FSEC or an external projection. What could that possibly be? Imagine this is cat. Well, that could possibly be N. That's the bottom part of an external projection, bottom part of an FSEC. And then, well, we do that. We self-merge that. Then we get a bigger structure. Well, what could that possibly be? If that was N, then the next thing higher than N is D or whatever, right? So basically, you don't need to appeal to heads that you're merging from the lexicon if you've independently got a hierarchy of functional projections. And we independently need to state a hierarchy of functional projections. Therefore, we don't need the heads. Therefore, there are no functional categories qua lexical items. There are no functional heads. That's the strongest kind of position you could take on this. And I'm going to show you how I think it works. Okay? So basically, the proposal then is that I'm going to talk about extended projections rather than FSEC or hierarchies of projections because I think Grimshaw's notion of extended projections is probably the best here. So basically we can say that extended projections serve to constrain the labeling of structure built by merge from roots. Okay? So what I'm really saying there then is that there are two kinds of things 
right? One, one, two kinds of lexicon kind of sense. One is a lexicon kind of roots, so that's cat, dance, run, drink, green, etc. Okay, and those are the things that are responsible for building structure, right? So you use roots, you self-merge them, you, uh, and so on, but they build structure. And then we have a set of categories, just syntactic categories effectively, and they label the structure. Right? So categories, the things we used to think of as T and little v and so on, those aren't lexical items in any sense. They're just categories that can label structure. Okay? So, and this is, just me, oops, this is just me being a little bit more explicit about what I said already. So, in a sense, if you, if you want to label structure, you need to do two things. One thing is you need to label roots, right? And all systems have to have a way of labeling a root. So, some lexical systems say, well, the root is a verb. comes along with the root, stored in the lexicon. Some systems, like Borer's, for example, say, or Marantz's, say, no, the root is the root. And then a piece of syn that root is embedded in a piece of syntax which then gives you the category of that root. But all systems have something that labels roots effectively, either on the root or immediately above the root. And then all systems, I said already, this, this is this uh, extended projection idea, all systems have some means of specifying the embedding relationship between functional categories. Even systems that say that that's C selection, which I don't think work, but all systems have some means of that. So that's, the, that's what we're appealing to here, these two ideas. So let's just kind of run through this then. So we could say then that in English, right, this looks a bit scary, but in English we have like, uh, we essentially have a set of what you might think of as transitions between one category and the next, right? And that's part of the grammar of English. It's constrained by the UG specification of what the extended projections can possibly be, okay? But actually the grammar of English is, it, it sort of picks out some subset of that. All right. So in English, you say that uh, I'm making assumptions about the analysis here. But in English, you say that you can transit from an N to a classifier functional category, which is where plural will be. You can tra class uh, transit from classifier functional category to numeral functional category, which is where numerals will be. You can, class you can transit from numeral to D, and so on. Okay? That just is part of the grammar of English, and it follows the, the universal grammar of the extended projection of the DP, of the N, rather. So then you have a derivation that looks like this. By now, I think you've got the idea, so, I won't run through it, so I'll run through it fairly fast. You take cat, you merge cat with itself, that gives you a set containing cat. You, go and you say to yourself, I need to label this. Well, I can label it as an N. I could label it as a V as well, right? That's one of Barrer's point. You can cat around the stage, you know, like this type of thing, right? So, um, so let's just imagine we label it with an N, okay? Then we self-merge that business, and we get a set containing the set containing cat, okay? We label that as classifier because we labeled the smaller one as N, and because we can go from N to classifier, right? And so on. Right? So basically all you do is you just kind of say, build a bit of structure, look at what's in me already, go and label it. No heads required. No functional heads required. I mean, the root is the only thing that's the head, really. And then you get a structure that looks like that. So that would be a structure for something like cats. Cats are fluffy in English. I mean, cats are fluffy in all languages. Cats are fluffy, quotes in English. Um, and so, oops. So basically what you've got then is, uh, is that cat there is is going to eventually, the whole thing is going to end up being pronounced as just cats in English. There's no, there's no D in, if you, if you uh, say cats in English. For plural. Okay, so um, we have unary structures, right? Merge is binary, but we can get unary structures out of it. Okay, okay. Uh, what about binary structures? Well, they just work the same way as they've always worked, right? But we need to extend the set of things that we're allowing to be transitions between functional categories now. So if we have a look, for example, at the verb phrase, so here we have, uh, you can go from big V to little v star. That's a perfectly good transition. And I'm going to say, this is massively simplifying. I'm going to say, you can go from D to little v star as well. So what this does is it keeps the external projection the same. And what this does is essentially allows you to jump from one external projection, one extended projection to another, okay? So if we run through the definite, if we run through a derivation, so you self-merge jump, you get something which you label as V, you self-merge Lily, you get something which you can label as D, again, simplifying massively probably. You merge the thing you've labeled as V, which has got jump in it, with the thing you've labeled as Lily, which gives you a binary structure now, and then that you're allowed to, mer you're allowed to label as V star, since here, you go from V to V star and D to V star, and that's what we've got here. 
Okay? So basically, I mean, it's like a phrase structure rule, essentially, at some level. Okay? Just a very general one. Now, what, what follows from this system is that the kinds of semantic relationships that we are accustomed to do via the geometry of the tree, so for example, unaccusative versus unergatives, is in this system done by the labels, because the trees end up looking very similar. Right? So for example, for something like an unergative like Lily jumped, you would say that you're merging Lily with jump. Okay? And in this case, you're allowed to, you're allowed to jump from D to V star, and from big V to V star, and then that will give you Lily jump. But an alternative would be you, mer you go from D to some functional cat category called O. It's like whatever thing gives you objects, right? So it could be ASP, it could be, you know, whatever it is. The thing that gives, the, that gives you objects. So you merge you from D to O and V to O, and then you get unaccusatives. So you see the distinction between unergatives and accusatives is the, the structure, the geometrical structure is the same. It's just the label. So back to my thesis again, <laughs> it's the functional categories that are really doing the semantic work in this, right? Rather than the structure of the tree. And then you can see an example, uh, here I've just given you a transitive verb where we essentially take those things and stick them together. Okay? All right. This doesn't, these don't look like normal trees, so I'm just giving you a second to kind of go. All right? Okay. <coughs> um, I'm going to skip this aside on case because I don't have time. All right. So um, this structure doesn't have any functional heads. So you might say to yourself, uh, David, what about things like inflection? Right? The kind of things that we normally use functional heads for. Right? So you would say, okay, you've got a T functional head. It's like ER in French. And you raise the verb to it and you get like the, you know, manger or whatever, right? Manger ha or whatever. Uh, so without functional heads, how are you going to do that? So the neat thing about this system is this system, this system looks very, very much like the kind of system of representations that Michi Brody put together in his mirror theory quite a few years back now, except in a kind of derivational setting. He did in a very representational kind of setting. And we can appeal to his basic idea that the way you get inflection is you spell out the whole of the extended projection as a single word, effectively. Right? So, for example, in something like uh, the Lily Bites Anson, what we do here is we build up our structure where we merge Anson with Bites, we can label the resulting outcome with this O thing. The semantics of that basically says, make Anson the theme of byte. Okay? We can take that whole tree, merge it with Lily, okay, to give us a little V star, because we can, um, we can transit from both O to V star and Lily to V star. The semantics of that is a Kratzerian semantics that says, this is the agent of this event. Okay? And, then we can, and then what we can do is we can take Lily and internally merge Lily with V star. So Lily internally merges with V star here, and the resulting element is T in this case, because we can go from V star to T and D to T. Okay? That's a question of how case works, which I'm going to skip over here. <coughs> now that whole thing, this whole thing here, byte plus O plus V star plus T, we can take that essentially as the word bytes. Right? So that whole thing here roots all the way up to here, is pronounced as a single word in English, in this case. It's the word bytes. And it's pronounced in a position in the tree, which is that V star, which is very similar to what we normally say, right? Big V moves to V star. But there's no head movement here, right? There's no head movement either to build the word or to put the word in its position in the tree structure. We still have to have a diacritic, a phonological diacritic that says, pronounce this here. So that's still mis mysterious in a sense, but it's, it's part of the direct linearization of structure into the phonology rather than any kind of syntactic feature. It's just a diacritic that says, pronounce this thing in this position. Okay? So there's no raising. There's no lowering. Right? So normally you would say that T lowers... If this, uh, the T would lower to V star to give you bytes, but there's no lowering in this system. The whole thing is just pronounced in one position. So French, you pronounce it here at T. English, you pronounce it here. Gallic, you probably pronounce it up here in Finn or something like that. Okay? Kiowa, maybe you even pronounce it as, way, as low down as here or here. Okay? So the position of where the verb is pronounced is just, di it's just a learnable diacritic, uh, a, a learnable property that you, uh, s that you um, capture via this phonological realization diacritic, which allows you to say that word formation 
is not in two different components of the grammar. It's not that you r use head movement to build words in French and you use lowering to build words in English. It's just all just how the morphology interprets this piece of, st of syntactic structure. Okay, so it's a neat system in, the, in as much as we don't have any functional heads, so we don't have any head movement, right? And of course, there's no way we can get this to, to I mean, this is a phonological diacritic we've got here, right? It, so this doesn't feed anything in the semantics. The semantics is given by T, V star, O, and V, not by where you pronounce this thing. There's no, f there's no way to feed this into the semantics. So you might say, well, what about those examples of who didn't anyone kiss? How are you going to deal with those? We'll come back to those in a second. <coughs> oh, yeah. Now, in fact. <laughs> You know, I have, I have these notes that tell me what I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm on like page three, so I haven't looked at any of them, so I may have missed things out, I guess. All right, so, um, which of the, so back to our case of which of them doesn't anybody like, okay? So uh, in that case, the Roberts take on this is that does and ain't somehow coalesce, maybe ain't as above does, does picks it up and pied pipes it up higher, and from that higher position, we have to ignore the fact that the int really wouldn't actually see command to anyone, but anyway, we do some magic, and then from that magic, we say, okay, this somehow C commands this, and, or that somehow C commands that, and licenses it, okay? I can't do that, right? That, that doesn't work in my system, because actually there's just no way, you know, there's no way to move the functional heads around, because there aren't any functional heads. So I can't do that for here. Okay. However, I think it's well known that actually negation appears in lots of places in, in the functional structure of the clause, right? So one place it certainly occurs in many languages is in C, all right? So if you look at Gaelic here, here's the Gaelic example. The cat didn't scratch Ian. Chadoskrop and kahtiain, right? So here this cha is in negation, and it's in complementary distribution with C. It is a negative C, effectively, right? So that's a negative C there. Okay. Well, if that's a negative C there in Gaelic, perhaps there's a negative C in English, right? And that is exact. And so there's nothing's moved to the negative C. Negative C is just there, right? So we can implement that idea in the following kind of way. We could say that act actually we have negation appearing in various parts of the clause structure, which seems to be phenomenologically true looking at different uh, languages. This is Zanettini's work, okay? And we can say that basically. Oh, uh, can you just ignore the auxiliary structure here? I'm going to come back to it later on. <coughs> so what we can say is that this negation here, in this case, it doesn't see command. It dominates anyone, right? And that is the relationship which licenses this. This relationship of aboveness licenses this. This one is not above that, so it doesn't license it. But this whole, this whole extended projection of the auxiliary here is pronounced in English in a question C right at the very top, right? So you say won't anyone buy Anson, right? So uh, what you say then is that, what I, what I need to say then, essentially, is that when you linearize up here, right, the overtness of this tells you that this is the thing that's the interpretable negation. And therefore, all of these, any other negation down below is not interpretable, right? But if you linearize lower down, then that's the interpretable negation. So there is some kind of surface structure relationship between... Uh, the, the pronunciation of this thing overtly and, uh, and where the interpretable feature is. Now, there's various ways of uh, implementing that, um, but that's the basic intuition. Um, so, uh, is there evidence for this? Well, actually, here's an example from my home dialect in Fife. I didn't know Ken him. I don't not know him, meaning I don't know him. Okay, so here we get the negation, ne, a dini, right? And then no here is another negation, which is at the VP level, a dini no ken him. So effectively, that would be, like in Hedda Zylstra's story, this would be an uninterpretable negation here, effectively. And this higher one here would be the interpretable one, okay? All right, so that's how that works. What kind of time we're at? Ten minutes, so that's good. <coughs> Okay, so, um, so that's the way I want to get rid of head movement, effectively. There are no heads, there's no head movement. There is a direct linearization of uh, pieces of extended projection in particular positions, and it gives us the effect, the word order effect of head movement. There, for, for this weird, little, weird cases where there does seem to be an interpretive effect, I take it to be the case that there's no movement going on. There just is a higher negation in these cases. Okay? And there's some work to be done 
on why the overtness, well, why that phonological feature is the feature that says the next thing down or the next, the, the, the negation closest to me is the interpretable one. So I, I think there's lots of ways to implement that idea, and I don't know which way is the right way yet. All right, so um, now, now on to roll up movement. We got rid of head movement, there is no head movement. We're doing word formation in a different way, and we're doing height in a different kind of way. It's sort of direct linearization. And that explains why head movement doesn't have an impact on interpretation. Now have a look, let's go to roll-up movement. Well, the system that I've got here, if you look at it, it's very symmetrical. So binary trees, you just take x and y, and you stick them together, and the, the label above x and y is some z that's not related to x and y in terms of projection of any sort. There isn't any head, so there isn't any projection either. Right? So we actually... I mean, all of, that, all of that problems of projection stuff just goes away. We don't even need to worry about it because there are no heads, which is kind of a nice result as well. Um, so the system is very symmetrical, right? All we're doing is we're merging two things, but that's not enough because we know that natural language needs asymmetries. It needs asymmetries if you believe in anything like the LCA, right? If you say you want specifiers to be on the left, you've got to say, well, there's an asymmetry between specifier and complement. And you probably need asymmetries for semantics as well to determine which composes for specifier or complement. So um, uh, the way that I, I propose to do this is to say, well, the only things we've got are extended projections, and that's what defines specifier versus complement. This is an idea, actually, that I think Dirk Burry first had in his thesis, where basically you say, so, so x here tells you you're in the same extended projection, and 3 and 4, this says I'm lower in that projection than I'm higher in that projection. Okay? So if you've got a structure like this, where you've got two things in the same extended projection, one higher and one lower, and you've got something in a different extended projection, then basically you can say that this is complementation and this is specifier relation. Specifier relation is the elsewhere case of functional complementation, which is given to you independently by these universal extended projections. Okay? <coughs> so that's what I need to do, effectively, to, to reconstruct the notion of specifier and complement, Complement meaning just functional complement because old style complements are just specifiers. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, now, this immediately rules out roll up movement. Right? Why is it roll up, roll up movement? We'll have a look at a, case, a, cl a classical case of roll up movement of some sort. Here we take some, here's some extended projection. There's a root down here somewhere. And we're building up this extended projection. We go through x3 up to x4. And then at this point, I want to roll up x3 and move it to a higher position here. So I do that, I take x3 and I move it to this higher position here, and then I get some higher part of the extended projection here, x5. Right? But now x5 and x4 are in a functional complementation relationship, because they're in the same extended projection. And x5 and x3 are in a functional complementation relationship, because they're both in the same extended projection. So there is no way of imposing an asymmetry in this structure, because there's nothing to tell you which one is the specifier and which one is the complement. Therefore, this structure is ruled out. Right? So roll-up movement in this system is just not possible because the argument goes, the system is purely symmetrical. We need asymmetry. We use extended projections, which is all we have, really, to create that asymmetry. The way you do that immediately gives you a system that says, if you roll up, you lose that asymmetry again. Therefore, you can't roll up. That's the theoretical argument, or the structure of the theoretical argument. <coughs> all right, so... Now that rules out cases like this, and eight, the, I mean, so it rules out roll-up movement. I've only got a few minutes left, five minutes, so I'm not going to go through how one would do roll-up reversal type things in this system. It's fairly straightforward, um, and you can read bits of the book that, go, that tell you how to do that. But, or you could just be, you know, nail them in an abels, and you could just say, oh, we're just going to join everything on the other side, right? Um, so it doesn't really matter, but you, uh, as long as you get the reverse scope without movement. Reverse order, rather, without movement. It's the same scope. Um, but what it will also rule out for us is these VP movement cases. VP moving over to here, okay? Uh, um, why will it rule that out? Well, because here, right, this V star is part of the same extended projection as focuses. Yeah? Because it's actually part of the extended projection that starts to eat. But this C is part of the same extended projection that focuses because it's part of the extended projection that starts at eat. Therefore, this is ruled out. Therefore, we can't have VP, to VP shift v via this kind of movement. So we rule out and ate the mouse lily just as well because and ate the mouse lily is ungrammatical. So that's a plus, right? 
But you might ask yourself, well, what about an ape the mouse lily did, or will, or something like that? So it follows from the system, right, that if I want to have something like uh, an ape the mouse lily will, I need to have two different extended projections. That is, two extended projections, each rooted in a different root. Right? Because that's the only way the system will ever be able to get a specifier complement distinction uh, at any point, actually. So this takes us back a little bit to a sort of like, you know, Ross-style analysis of uh, auxiliaries in a sense. Because so, what you get, oops, what you get here then is you say that, that let's take a modal like will, we say that that starts, that can root an extended projection in English. Right? It's like a verb in that sense. Right? It's not quite like a verb, but it's like a verb in the sense that it can root an external projection. Right? And then we can say that something like eat the mouse, again, I've, I'm simplifying this somewhat, but we can say that eat the mouse is the specifier, is a specifier in that extended projection. If anyone wants to know how that works exactly, I can show you later on. Um, and that's a specifier now. Specifiers are happy to move. You can move specifiers because specifiers are already specifiers. <laughs> right? This is, a, this is a specifier relationship, that's a complementation relationship, so this is a specifier, so we can happily move it up to here, but only if we have two rooted extended projections. Right? But that's exactly what we have here. We have one rooted with will and one rooted with eat. But that immediately, of course, captures the head government effect on VP shift. It says you need to have another root here. Okay? So, uh, well, that's kind of neat. I think, anyway. <coughs> All right. So uh, what this does is it explains why you can't just move the verb phrase on its own, right? Because that would give rise to roll-up configuration. System rules that out. It, says it forces there to be two extended projections involved, right? One of those extended projections is essentially going to be the auxiliary or some dummy which roots another extended projection from the one you're moving. And um, I've said it explains why... Oops, yeah why the moving XP doesn't bear finite inflection, which of course is because the moving XP here, right, is not in the same extended projection as finite T. Therefore, it can't be inflected as finite T. Now, there's some interesting dialectal stuff to do with when you can get copying of the form here on here, but you never get this finite, right? Sometimes you get a mismatch between what's expected here and here, but you'd never get this actually finite. Okay, so, uh, so I think that, in a sense, what the system does is it, it captures one little part of what head government used to do. Now, we know that head government didn't work in the end. We abandoned head government as a story for, tra as for trace licensing in general because we have, had to have a disjunctive ECP and all that kind of stuff that you guys probably learned about in your syntax classes. Um, but this really just captures one of the effects that was underneath the head government effect. All right, final conclusions. On in, in one minute. Huh, there we go. I didn't even time this. It worked perfectly. All right. So um, what we've done then is I've developed a theory of phrase structure representation that just removes two kinds of analytical device in our system, right? One thing it, rem it removes is the possibility of head movement, and the other thing it removes is the possibility of roll-up movement. I've argued that neither head movement nor roll-up movement are syntactic operations that have a semantic uh, that do anything in terms of the semantic representation, and therefore we shouldn't really have them in the syntax. I mean, that's maybe a strong claim, but basically these these movements are really just movements for word order, okay? Um, and I think that movements for word order should be dealt with via word order, <laughs> and not via necessarily things that don't have any semantic relationship. Um, and then it, it, uh, it captures this government requirement uh, on VP fronting. So uh, there are these possible counterexamples from Polish, but I'm sure what's happening in Polish, where you apparently get the VP moving, uh, Adam, that guy, he has, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, thank you. So he has, he has VP movement uh, in, in Polish with no head to govern the thing, but I think you can maybe reanalyze that as, as, sh as various shifts of other arguments. But I'm not sure yet, so Polish may be a counterexample. I'm sure it's not. Uh, okay, so there are a bunch of other benefits to this system that I haven't talked about, um, but you can go and read about those. But I think actually the, the fundamental thrust of this is that what it attempts to do is more deeply connect 
the syntactic features and the syntactic operations to the things that have an effect on meaning. So that basically what syntax can be seen as, as fundamentally an engine for driving compositional meaning, as opposed to something which is uh, unrelated to that. And I think that this system brings us a step closer to that, and that's it. Okay, so we have some um, half an hour. Half an hour? Wow. Well, well, if we then hurry. <laughs> no, yeah, so, okay. I think Jeff was the first one. All right, thank you very much, David. It's very interesting. Uh, I just have two quick uh, questions, one theoretical and one empirical. Uh, theoretical question, uh, where is the FSEC? In the ah, grammar. Yeah. So for you, as I, I think I understood you, it's not part of merge, it's not selection, so it's not part of the lexical item. Uh, where do you look when you look to see the FSEC? Where is that? That's the theoretical question. Okay. The empirical question is about uh, English int, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and as I say in my poster, and I'm worried about this, why is it the case that int can induce these um, syncretisms on the stem, whereas not can't, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. okay. it, it seems, I might misunderstand you, but it seems in your system uh, that there's no uh, morphological locality between int and the stem uh, that's any mm -hmm. more, it's not any more close than it is to, to say not uh, with the stem. So uh, how can you account for things like ain't or weren't leveling? Yeah, okay. So theoretical Thank question, you. yeah, theoretical question first. So way back sometime when, here, uh, there. Um, so I have this thing here, this lambda, big lambda. I don't know why I call it, oh, for labels, I guess. No, label transition function or something. Um, which has in it, so what, this is what you look at, right? So when you're, when you're doing your labeling, you're like, oh, I've got a label. I've got to label this thing. What do I label it by? Oh, uh, it's a root. I can label it as n. Or in this case, I've got to label this whole thing. What do I do it by? Well, I look at the label I gave to this. It's an n. From n, I can go to classifier. <laughs> So there's so this is so technically this is just stored. It's like a it's like an augmented it's like a straightforward transition network. It just sort of says this is all we have, right? It's just a s dumb stipulation. Deeper question: Why is that? Why is that? And why is it that in English? So I think that the reason why things are like that in languages in general is probably one of the biggest questions for syntax now, for the next 10 years or whatever, till we solve it. Um, my hunch is that, is that w it, it's fundamentally got to do, well, uh, there may be different things involved, but one aspect of what's involved is, uh, is kind of non-linguistic, is, 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 is kind of linguistic reification of non-linguistic cognitive complexity. So, um, you know, I, th I think there are kinds of operations, that, you, like co non-linguistic operations you want to do on scopally relevant elements. So let's take three green balls or something like that. How do you get the meaning of, th how do you ident identify three green balls if you've got like a whole pile of red and green balls? Well, you, I mean, what you do is you say, okay, I mean, take, there are two ways to do it. You can say I could take all the subsets of three things and then I could reject from those the ones that have anything but green things in it. Or I could take all the green things, and then I could just subsect, sub subtract three from that. The second operation is a much more simple operation. They both give you the same result, right? The second operation is a simpler operation, because it doesn't involve a non-monotonic piece of inference. My guess is that what's happening is that, 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 that what syntax does is it sort of fixes the simplest kinds of operation into, uh, into this kind of thing. But I mean, this is complete speculation, right? That's just kind of what I think is going on with that. Um, but this is how, it's, I mean, technically, it's just encoded as, as a transition network. It's just very dumb, right? And that's what you look at. Second question about int is, let's go to int. Uh, that will, will do. So, um, I mean, the word is this. That's the word. Quite, it's got quite a lot of stuff in it, right? But it's like goes all the way from here up to here. Okay. So, um, so we, I, I, the question then is, um, what's the relationship between each label here 
and pieces of morphological structure. If you were in a very agglutinative kind of language, you would just say, imagine this was Hungarian, and this was uh, Brody's initial uh, um, attempt to do this, you would just say, okay, well, we take this thing here, we pronounce it. Well, that's the same thing, so maybe we don't pronounce those differently. We take that, then we pronounce it, then we pronounce that, then we pronounce, well, I don't know if you pronounce that, if you have two negations. So basically the idea would be that you say, like, each one of these corresponds to morpheme, but actually, you know, you can easily just ban this whole thing. You just take that whole thing and say, I'm storing as a, as a morphological form for that, the word won't. Because right? that's what's in your input. What you're in your input is won't. Right? You don't, so, so this whole thing, this whole piece of syntactic structure is simply correlated with won't. What I really think happens is that during learning, you, you kind of attempt to, to pronounce each one as the morphologically segmentable bit. And then at some point you learn that uh, you don't need to do that. You can pronounce the whole thing as a single unit. So, uh, um, you know, and then you kind of lose the old one. So I, I have this story, which you might know, which is about, about um, uh, variable realization of, uh, of agreement and things like that, where you can do it in this exactly this kind of way. You say, well, you've just got multiple lexical entries all rooted at the same thing, all meaning the same thing, all the same category. They've just got different phonologies. And what happens is that during the process of learning, you prune some of those away. That's like elsewhere type thing, right? And you just get left over with what you're left over with. And that would be the suppletive form won't, which is presumably because it's the most frequent in the input. So uh, with will not, not, is not, not isn't going to be here. Not would have to be like here. <laughs> it's a specifier of some kind. So the other thing I haven't dealt with, I haven't talked about, is how things like... Uh, so I talked about inflection, but I haven't talked about words like the, right? So is the, is it, is it a segment of this? Oh, oh, no, of that, obviously. Is it a segment of, a, of an extended projection, or is it a specifier in, a in an extended projection? So is the complex? I think I want to say it's a specifier and it's complex. I don't know if I said that in the book, but that's what I'm leaning towards. Anyway, so that's the story for, for this. I saw another question, Andrus, or... Oh. I think he was the second. Anders? One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Do I need a microphone? We're here. Not for me. Maybe people, I'll repeat your question if you like. Uh, okay, so here is uh, in defense of. Okay, it's coming, sorry. Uh, in defense of uh, movement that doesn't uh, have any effect on meaning, right? Um, uh, words have to be in some order, right? Uh, and, and, well, and. Syntax has to serve both the CI interface and has to serve PF as well. So uh, the, uh, the hierarchic structure has to be spelled out in, you know, as a linear string. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, so what you need is, what you want to have is some systematic uh, mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, and, okay, and, and then you have, in, in syntax, you have movement for, you know, chain formation and, and mm -hmm. A bar and A movement and so on. So, uh, why not have movement also in order to just serve only PF to, to, to derive those um, strings, right? With uh, a lot of idiosyncrasy in, involved, I mean, because they just have to be, the words have to be in some order. There has to be a systematic relation. So, um, uh, yeah, so why not movement? Why not even um, uh, have, you know, utilize movement to the full? I mean, we don't actually know uh, how, you know, our processing, you know, brain processing capacity. I mean, the fact that, I'm, you know, this is in defense of, mm -hmm. of even the most radical kind of, of uh, roll-up movement theory. It is, you know, the, the, it's, you have to re reiterate lots of, and do lots of movements to derive uh, pretty on the face of it, pretty simple strings. But so what? Why not? It's a simple kind of operation. It's used anyway. Uh -huh. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess there. Okay, so um, I, it's, it's sort of an interesting question about what counts as motivation for movement, I guess, right? So you could imagine that. So that what you're saying is that there are effectively PF motivations for movement. Yeah. And those PF motivations for movement are, are given by just what the learner does when the learner hears stuff. Yeah. 
right? So it just hears this. And it's got to be a systematic relation. And, from and you have the, the LCA, hierarchy. which yeah. says, this is the order that you should have. So the kid goes, ah, it's the wrong order. The only way I can get that, ro that other order is by moving things around. And then, but then I, what, I, what I'd need to do is need to make sure that that kind of movement never leaves a trace because it never reconstructs. Mm -hmm. But that's distinct from a kind of movement that, that does leave a trace and does reconstruct. So how do I know as a kid that this roll-up movement, as opposed to non-roll-up movement, will not leave a trace, right? And if you allow roll-up movements to leave traces, you get all sorts of wrong predictions about what binding possibilities are available for exactly the kind of things that Chomsky was talking about yesterday, for incredibly weird little strange parts of the grammar. So, in the, I mean, the reason I came to this conclusion, I mean, the reason all of this emerged was originally I was, I was looking at um, the ordering of PPs in, in Scottish Gaelic noun phrases, right? And, uh, and I was kind of just exploring a roll-up story of those. Um, but then I find this weird binding linearization asymmetry that emerged. And I realized that like, if you did this via a roll-up system, you had to selectively say when and when you could not reconstruct. But the evidence for this is like there's no evidence for it. Right? As Chomsky would have said yesterday, there's just no evidence that's available in the input, even though I mean, the phenomenon is very straightforward and very clear. So if you imagine a learner it, trying to learn Scottish Gaelic, and thinking to itself, ah, yes, there's roll-up movement. Okay, so um, how, how does that learner ever get to the point of knowing I never have any traces for this kind of roll-up movement? I do have traces for other kinds of movement because there's no evidence to let that learner know there are no traces for roll-up movement. And since roll-up movement is just movement and movement leaves traces, how do you know you've essentially got to delete those not just from the phonology but also from the semantics? So I think that... that there's a sort of learnability issue that creeps in when, when you say we have purely PF kinds of movement which have a different phenomenal, I mean a different you know, ontology from say A movement or A bar movement in terms of how they interrelate with semantics. There's just not enough evidence for anyone to ever learn that they shouldn't have traces. So I think that's the fundamental argument for why you don't want to have roll-up movement. You're right, you could say, well, it's just a PF thing, but how does the kid know it's only there to do word order and there are no traces left over? And if you leave the traces, you're buggered. You can't get the right facts. Did I just say that on video? Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Sh short one. I think he was, and then Ivanaya, he had this, this, but, but she's... Okay. I'm just here. Okay, I think... Hi. I think I'm just like a reversal of Anders' question. Okay. So I'm wondering, because for me, the thing where, I th I'm, even though in principle I'm on your side in that I think we shouldn't have operations that do not have semantic effect, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what exactly it means, an interpretive effect for head movement, because I think there are two possible interpretations. One thing is that you're going to interpret the head movement itself, and the other option is that you're going to interpret the structure that head movement allows you to create. It's the structure and one that I'm interested in. Yeah. Right? yeah, and so, and then you might want to, um, one might consider an option uh, such as, for example, you know, in Denikin's work, if you have something like um, a face extension by head movement, what you're essentially getting is you suddenly end up with larger structure which would create a semantic unit for purposes of LF representation. And you might interpret that as an interpretive effect. And I think that you might be throwing out uh, a baby with the bath mm. here, because there might be cases that, or you know, like uh, if I'm to cite uh, Holmberg, like if you think the uh, object, gener uh, sorry, object shift, um, his object shift generalization. So there seems to be correlation between head movement and places where you can find something like scrambling or object shift. And again, one might argue, as you know, I did for example in my thesis, uh, that uh, you cannot have uh, scrambling if you do not have head movement, because head movement creates a structure which allows you to create certain type of representations. Yeah, so I think what, I mean, so what you're saying is, I mean, you, you've said all of this in terms of head movement, right? But I mean, you could restate all of that in terms of where the extended projection is linearized, right? So if you take scrambling, which is uh, for, as an, or object shift as an example, for, right? You could say that 
the fact that the thing is linearized in a high position shows you that that is the unit that's, uh, that's going to be transferred in the end. It's the faithful unit that's going to be transferred, which allows you to say that, that you've then got, a, you know, you've got the space to do some syntactic movement inside that unit, right? So, if you, so I think that where these things are linearized correlate with the size of syntactic domains, right? But that's not to say that it correlates with Sem with, you know, it's not to say that it has an effect on the semantic interpretation, right? So you could say that maybe there's a correlation between the height where you pronounce this extended projection at. Maybe you always pronounce it, you know, a cer certain kind of phasal edge or something like that. Um, and therefore, there's syntactic stuff that can go on in that stuff, in that space. And that, of course, will, if it's non head movement, it's other kind of movement, that will have a correlation with semantics. But it's, it's only indirect. It's not so. I don't think you need to say, in fact, you don't need to say that uh, the head movement itself has any impact on semantic interpretation. So, right? I mean, it is, it is curious, don't you think, that, like, you know, I, I mean, I, I you, 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 look, you look at A movement or A bar movement, and there's, like, vast amounts of evidence that we built up over the years that these things feed particular kinds of semantic uh, stuff, right? Semantic operations or semantic interpretations. And looking at head movement, it's just, it's really hard to find good cases of that. I mean, the, the anyone case is like the best I could find. It's Lechner. Lechner is, that is not a good case. Why? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, th the, the number of auxiliary assumptions okay, yeah. that need to be put in place to deal with, to, to deal with that stuff, I, I just don't think it's, it's not a compelling argument at all. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then head as a last one, yeah? Uh, yeah, just a brief uh, clarification question about, uh, so you dispose of functional heads. I was wondering what you do with functional features. Assuming that you still want to have functional features, do you assume there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the hair, well, not call them heads, but the things in categories. the fun categories. Yeah, the categories in the functional sequence? Uh, and if so, no. what do you... Okay. So, so I mean, I, mean I, I, I take the position that uh, Peter Spinelius and I argued for in our features paper <coughs> that essentially um, there are second-order properties of categories, things like that little sigma that says spell me out here, or so there's... So th those functional features that say fill my specifier or pronounce me here or whatever, that kind of stuff, I take that to be a second order feature of a head. Five features, I don't know yet. I don't know what to quite do with five features. So you could take them simply to be extra decorations on the like Christmas tree things, right? Like little bubbles on the on the categories, and uh, and then enter. I mean, just in the standard way, enter into normal kinds of really, uh, syntactic dependency relationships. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think I want to say. I, I mean, there's that whole nano syntactic line that says, and actually Canian line as well that says each interpretable feature is a head. That's okay. I think just about. Um, for me, it'd be, a ca it'd be a category, mm -hmm. right? It'd be a, a, a label, effectively. Um, and then you could maybe say that the uninterpretable features are simply extra, extra fluff on those interpretable features. And then there's a question about how many you get on there, right? And whether they're all second order or whether you can have first order features there whether as well. they would be specified in the functional sequence they, or somewhere? No, they would just be learned decorations of the labels. Right? So, I mean, it depends what you think they are, but if they're just something, there's a zero minutes. <laughs> we can talk about this over a beer. <laughs> you can <coughs> the train, yeah? Okay. Ed. Thanks. Is this on? Thanks a lot. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks a lot for a very interesting, a very clear talk. Um, I have one empirical and one theoretical question. So, empirically, there's more interpretive effects or alleged interpretive effects of head movement. One thing is English mustn't, must not, mm -hmm. um, which generally gets a reading where must takes scope over negation, but in a downward and tailing context, it gets a reading where actually must takes scope under yeah. negation, which you can readily account for in terms of head movement with semantic conditions on reconstruction, but I would wonder how such a thing would work under your system. The more general question that I have is more about the categories and values. So suppose at some point you remerge, you self-merge uh, something with a label X and then it gets a label T for tense. Now you can spell it out as past tense and it can be interpreted as past tense. 
the same for present tense, but how is it known in the syntax when you just label it for T that it will receive a particular pronunciation and a particular interpretation? And that's, that's a version of George's question, right? So it's the same basic thing. So, it, I mean, is T, so do I have, you know, past and present as two separate labels? So some people have proposed such things. In fact, that's the Starkian kind of view of these kinds of things. Or do I say that T comes along with a, a, a limited set of features which specify the semantic value of T? Both are compatible with what I'm saying. My gut instinct is the second, right? That like based, so for, let's say we have number, right? I, would, I, I mean... What I'd really like to say is that, is that, you know, the ways you build up plural, for example, whether it's plus minus augmented and plus minus atomic or whatever, what you'd want to say is that each of those is in a separate functional head. But I don't think there's any, I mean, that's just sort of, you know, aesthetics. I think there's no need to do that. You could bundle them and have a single functional head and have to work in ditto with tense. You can do just exactly the same thing. On mustn't, um, I mean, I, I mean, that argument about mustn't and in downward and tailing contexts, I don't think that you need to rely on head movement for that. Um, but I, I actually think about that a bit more, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it necessarily relies on head movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They asked me so that I finish so that you have time to go to the other building. And in the same time, please sign the papers. <laughs> Yeah, the, it's a Brussels grant, and we learned yesterday that each day must have extra signature. So somehow you shouldn't leave without signing three times. Oh, really? <laughs> no, that's what, yeah, they need extra sheet for every day because every day must be accounted separately. Well, wow. we won't die if you don't, yeah, but if you can, <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thanks. Mm -hmm. I was trying to be here rather than